It is good to be here and to see all of you here today. And so we're going we're gonna to do another, um, another lesson in kind of a mini-series that we started back before Easter with some major events that happened in the life of Christ, beginning with his pre-crucifixion suffering. And then we talked about the crucifixion itself. And then we talked about his burial and the incredible significance that that is and how that burial custom gave undeniable proof of the resurrection. And then we talked about his ministry between his burial and his resurrection where he went into the heart of the earth. He actually went into hell and he went into paradise and all incredible things happened. And then he rose from the dead. We talked about the resurrection. Last week we talked about his ascension. That he actually went back to heaven, and we're going to take up with the ascension today, and we're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus. The next major event, as far as Jesus is concerned, is he's coming back again. And so let's pray together and ask God to help us understand what his word has to say about that. Father, I thank you because you're good and you're kind and you're gracious and you're always more than enough. You've given us your word. You've told us to study it and memorize it and meditate on it and, and Lord, to learn from it and listen as you speak to us through the pages of Scripture. And so, Father, I pray that you'll help us do that today. Send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and show us things that we need to know from your word. Father, you just speak to us from heaven today and we'll give you the praise for that. In Jesus' name and for his sake, and amen. amen. So, the second coming of Jesus. And we're going to kind of start with this section out of Acts chapter 1, verse number 11. It's in the second part of that verse. These angels showed up, and they said to those original disciples, This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. An angelic announcement immediately after he ascended that he is coming back again. So the next major event that's going to happen in the timeline of the events that revolve around Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, is his return. The angels said so. You see, in the previous lesson, we examined the ascension of Jesus. We talked about the fact that in Acts chapter 1, verse number 9, Luke wrote it. He wrote, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Such a spectacular event, and yet it was described with such simplicity. Luke used four words to describe one of the most significant events in human history. He was taken up. That's pretty clear, isn't it? He just was taken up. He went up. He ascended. And while Jesus was ascending into the clouds, apparently still in view of his awestruck disciples, two angels appeared. Luke wrote about it in the verse that uh, follows this one. He wrote, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. These were obviously angelic beings dispatched from heaven to appear on earth in the form of men. They broke the upward gaze of Jesus' disciples with a question. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? That's in the first part of verse 11 in Acts 1. And then they confirmed for those stunned disciples a promise that Jesus had already made to them. That is reminded them of what Jesus had said. This is what they said in that last part of verse 11 that we read in the beginning. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back. What a promise. Will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. You see, these words were an angelic confirmation of the promise Jesus made when he said this in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Do you get that? I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So the angels just confirmed what Jesus had already said. 
And that is, I'm going away, but I will come back. I will come again. So I want to get, this morning, I want us to get a glimpse into the nature of Jesus' return. What's it going to be like when he comes back? Imagine the sorrow that must have filled the disciples' hearts as they watched Jesus leaving them. They've been with him for three and a half years or so. They've seen some incredible things. He's met their every need. He's provided for everything that they could ever desire. He has done everything that needed to be done. He was their source, and suddenly he's gone. Accordingly, the angels offered comfort to them, by explaining that this same Jesus whom they were watching ascend would come again. That's what they said. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In this angelic statement, we have a clear promise of the second coming of the Lord Jesus, as well as a glimpse into how he will come. According to these angels, he will come back in the same way you have seen him go. The question we need to investigate is, how did he go? And then we'll understand more about how he's going to return. And so we'll talk about that. I'm going to give you three particular points about how he left. First of all, he ascended from the Mount of Olives. He was standing on a Mount of Olives and standing there talking to them, giving them some instructions, what they're supposed to do while he's gone. And suddenly, he was taken up. That's what Acts chapter 1, verse 12 says. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, which was a Sabbath day's walk from the city. So he left from the Mount of Olives. And he will then return to the Mount of Olives because the, the angel said that he's going to come back the same way that he left. If he left from the Mount of Olives, he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, and then down in verse number 4, that, that Old Testament prophet said this about the Lord. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And then down in verse number 4, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. So where's he coming back to? He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. Now, here's another point. He ascended visibly. In other words, they could see him as he was leaving. Uh, That's what Acts 1, 9 says. It says he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were seeing him as he left. And if he's going to come back the same way that he left, then it means that people are going to see him when he returns. He will return visibly. Matthew 24, verse 30 tells us that. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. People saw him when he left. People are going to see him when he comes back again. And then here's a final one. He ascended into a cloud. Uh, That's what Acts 1, 9 says. He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Uh, and, 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 and he's going to return from the clouds of heaven. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 30. He said, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. He left in a cloud, he's coming back in a cloud with power and great glory. So he's going to come back again the same way that he left, but you don't know how he's going to come back unless you know how he left. And so we've looked at that. Now let's talk about the time of Jesus' return. Everybody always perks up their ears when you talk about when Jesus is coming back again. So I want you to get this. Only the Father knows the exact time of his son's return to earth. If you hear some... Preacher, some pastor, some rabbi, some Bible teacher, some self-proclaimed prophet telling you that he studied the prophecies and he's figured out when Jesus is coming back again and he begins to set dates. You need to put a red check mark by his name and say, don't listen to what he has to say. Because the scripture tells us that no one knows. Um, Matthew chapter 24, verses 27, and then down in verse number 36, this is what Jesus said. As the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, it's going to happen quickly. 
As quickly as a bolt of lightning flashes through the sky, that's how quickly Jesus is going to return. And then you go down into verse number 36, and he says, but, even though it's going to happen, and it's going to happen quickly, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So has anybody figured this out yet? No. The angels don't know. Jesus himself doesn't know. Only the Father knows when his Son will return. So if anyone says he can tell you when Christ will return, he's either deceived or he's dishonest, and don't you believe it? You believe what the Word of God says. The return of Christ will be sudden and unexpected. That's what Jesus said. He said, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. When the world is least expecting him to come, guess what will happen? He will. He's going to come suddenly. He's going to come unexpectedly. Jesus also said regarding the unexpected nature of his return, John recorded his words in Revelation 16, 15. He said, behold, I am coming as a thief. How does a thief come? Unexpectedly. It'll sneak up on you. You don't know when he's going to come. If you know when he's going to come, then you're going to take precautions and not let him break into your house and steal everything you've got. But the thief comes unexpectedly. And so he says, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, even though of that day and hour no one knows, even though that's true, God has revealed in Scripture where in the timeline of end time events the return of Jesus will occur. You know, he's given us all, all these different things that he says are going to happen in, in the lineup of the timeline that precedes and that follows the return of his son. And, and we know that. He's done that. We don't know when these things are going to happen, but we can kind of get a timeline, at least an, a, a sequence of events in mind as we study the scriptures. And he began to do so when he inspired the ancient prophet Daniel to write some intriguing words in his prophecy. These are found in Daniel chapter 12, verse number 11. Way back in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel wrote this. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. I need to give you this. Daniel was writing in this particular section of his prophecy about a time that he calls, and we'll see this in just a minute, about a time that he calls a time of trouble. When you get over into the New Testament, Jesus referred to it as a time of tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world until the time that Jesus predicted it would happen. So Jesus and Daniel were talking about that same time period. If you study over in the book of Revelation, you'll see that it is a seven-year period of time. And during that seven-year period of time, the first three and a half years or so, the character that we call the antichrist the lawless one the man of sin he's called by different things in the bible he's going to be gaining power and ultimately become the ruler of a global empire a global kingdom in order to do that he's going to have to make some agreements with the nation of Israel because just prior to those seven years there's going to be a battle called the battle of Gog and Magog you can read about that back in Ezekiel's chapter 38 and 39 this major world war is going to break out when enemies from the north of Israel attack Israel from the north and this major world war breaks out Israel wins the war and becomes the uncontested superpower of the world of that day in the aftermath of that major world war, when the world is in a broken condition, um, 
nations are bankrupt and, and the world is just clamoring for somebody to help them through the, through the economic collapse and all of the things that are going to happen during that time. And, and so they're going to be looking for a ruler who can help them put together the pieces of this broken world. And the devil is going to have his man ready, and we call him the Antichrist. He's going to be a man of military genius and economic genius and political genius, and he'll be able to step into that power vacuum in the world of that day and become the ruler of a global empire. But in order to do that, he's going to have to make a covenant. He's going to have to make an agreement. He's going to have to enter into a contract with the nation of Israel because that nation will be the uncontested superpower of the world of that day. Most Americans don't like to hear that, but it will be true. I want you to get this. One of the agreements that he's going to make with them is to rebuild their temple and reestablish their Jewish form of worship. Let them do that. And that includes daily sacrifices. Sacrifice in the morning, sacrifice in the evening, all kinds of other sacrifices. And, and that, that'll all be reestablished. And Daniel predicted then that about halfway through that seven-year period of time that he's going to turn on the nation of Israel when he thinks he has an ironclad grip on the government of the world of that day, he will turn on the nation of Israel. And he will strip away from them many of the privileges that he gave them in order to gain power, one of them being the opportunity to practice their Jewish form of religion, which included these sacrifices. And Daniel writes about that here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished... So he's going to stop letting them do it. He's going to abolish that practice. And the abomination that causes desolation is set up. So there's going to be this thing called the abomination of desolation. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But from that time, from the time those two things occur, he says there will be 1,290 days. And if you read the context in Daniel chapter 12, you'll see that what he's saying is there's going to be 1,290 days from that point until the end of this time of trouble, until the end of the tribulation period. If you just do the math, you would see that, that, that these events, this, this abolishing of the daily sacrifice and this abomination of desolation being set up, uh, you would see that, that it, it's going to occur about 1,290 days three and a half years before the end of the tribulation period. Well, if the tribulation period is seven years long and you back up from the end three and a half years, you're right smack dab in the middle. You're three and a half years into the tribulation period, three and a half years from the end of it. Daniel described it as a time of trouble. He wrote this in Daniel chapter 12, verse number one. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. So this abomination that causes desolation will occur about halfway through that seven-year tribulation period. And the abomination that causes desolation will be an event that takes place in the Jewish temple, which will be rebuilt in the city of Jerusalem. And it will cause the Jews to forsake their temple, thus causing it to become desolate. That event that will cause the Jews to forsake their temple will be this, the Antichrist. This lawless one, this man of sin, will set himself up in the temple in Jerusalem, declaring himself to be God. He abolishes Jewish religion again, and then he sets himself up in their temple and declares that he is God. He makes the, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem the headquarters of his evil government when he turns on the nation of Israel. Paul described this event when he wrote to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He wrote, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. Uh, King James Bible calls it a falling away, people turning away from God in mass during those early years of the tribulation period. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and, get this, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or that is worship. Here it is. So that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. That will be an abomination as far as the Jews are concerned. 
that he sets himself up in their holy place and declares that he is God. As a result of that, and maybe because of their religious convictions, maybe because of their fear of his power that he will have amassed by this time, they will flee from Jerusalem, thus forsaking their temple and causing it to become desolate. Desolate meaning empty. And so the abomination of desolation is described there by Paul in 2 Thessalonians. Jesus warned the Jews to flee from Judea when, when the abomination that causes desolation is standing in their holy place. What is the holy place to a Jew? It's their temple. And Jesus said that the abomination of desolation will be standing in their holy place. And when, when it happens, they were to flee from Judea. This is what he said. It's in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16. He said, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through Daniel. We started with Daniel talking about that. And Jesus is saying Daniel wrote about that. And so when you see that um, that was spoken of by Daniel, then let the le reader understand. Then that lo let those who are in Judea those Israelis who live in Judea in what today we would call the modern-day nation of Israel, let them do what? Flee to the mountains. It's kind of like a warning. Run for your lives. The Antichrist is going to hate the people of Israel because he is influenced by Satan. And Satan hates the Israeli people because that is the nation through whom God chose to bring his son into the world, and he hates Jesus and everything associated with him. And so he tells them to these Israeli people living at that time, flee to the mountains. They will flee from the oppression of this man of lawlessness, this antichrist, to a special valley prepared by Jesus as he returns to earth. He's going to prepare a special place for this Jewish nation to hide from the oppression of the Antichrist. And he does that because they are his chosen nation. I want you to notice this. The ancient prophet Zechariah wrote about it in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. On that day, his feet, that's Jesus' feet, the returning Messiah, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. And you will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. That's a prediction of some huge geographic changes in the nation of Israel. The Mount of Olives splitting, forming a huge valley, the Jews flee into that valley, and God protects them from the oppression of the Antichrist who has taken over the city of Jerusalem, taken over the temple, um, no longer allowing it to be used for religious purposes, but sets himself up there and uses it as the headquarters of his global government and declares that he's God, the abomination of desolation. As the Jews are fleeing from the oppression of this man of lawlessness at the midpoint of the tribulation period, then Jesus will return for his saints. He's going to come back and get the believers at that point. This is what he said. It's in Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. After telling them to flee, and we're at the midpoint of the tribulation period, they're supposed to flee. He's going to prepare this big valley for them. The abomination of desolation has set up, have been set up in the temple and they're fleeing, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of glory, or clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect, his chosen ones, uh, we call these believers, from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So what do we call that when Jesus comes back for his saints? And we call that the rapture? The resurrection of deceased believers will happen about this time. And, and the rapture, the catching away of living believers will happen at this time. 
And so it happens about midpoint through the tribulation period. And you say, well, then tell us when. I can't tell you when because we don't know when the tribulation period starts. We don't know when the battle of Gog and Magog is going to happen. But we need to be watching for that. And every time there is a skirmish, every time there is some kind of crisis surrounding the nation of Israel, we need to be looking at that. You know, I, I told you several months ago, about six months ago or so, when this whole, whole war between Hamas and Israel started, to take a deep breath and don't get excited because the enemy is, is not coming from the right direction. But then Hezbollah out of Lebanon and, and Islamic Jihad out of Syria you know, they start kind of getting in the fray. And then I told you, just watch that. Why did I tell you that? Because the thing that is going to initiate this battle of Gog and Magog out of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is an enemy invades Israel from the north. Not from the east, not from the west, but from where? From the north. So, we got to watch that. You say, oh, Iran shot missiles and shot dr you know, sent drones into Israel. And that's, that's bad. But Iran is to the east of Israel. But Iran has little puppet terrorist organizations in the north of Israel. And if backed by Iran, Lebanon and Syria attack Israel and invade from the north, that is something we need to be looking at. I'm not saying that that would be the beginning of the battle of Gog and Magog, but I'm saying it could be, and we need to be looking at it. We need to be doing what Jesus said to do. Watch and pray, because you don't know when the Lord may come. And so we need to be looking at that, and it, it needs to motivate us to give some thought to eternal issues. Okay, now, let me explain this to you, too, about the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus comes in two phases. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. He will first come for his saints. He'll come and get us. We just saw that. He will come after us, and isn't that what he told them? Um, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, what will I do? I'll come again and receive you to myself so that where I am there you may be also. So he's going to come for his people, his saints, but he's also then later going to come with his saints. And so we need to see that. And we need to be sure that when we're studying about the second coming of Christ, we, we sep separate these two events because the second coming uh, actually happens in two phases. Well, let's look at phase one. At the midpoint of that seven-year tribulation period, Jesus will return for his saints. The resurrection, the rapture, all of that will happen. He said it like this, Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31, and we've already looked at this, but let's look at it again. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. There comes a time when he's gonna come and gather his people out of this place. You get that? That's coming for his saints. Paul described the return of Christ for his saints when he wrote this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. That's the resurrection of the bodies of believers all over the planet. They're going to rise first. And then after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. The bodies of deceased believers are called out of the graves, transformed into a new kind of body that can um, endure forever, for eternity with Jesus reunited with their spirits that come back with him into the clouds up above the earth, up above in the atmosphere of the earth. And then those of us who are still living, what happens to us? We're going to be caught up. We call that the rapture, the snatching away. We're going to be caught up to meet them in the air. And Paul said that instantaneously, as we're being caught up, guess what happens to our bodies? He said we'll be changed in the moment and the twinkling of an eye. 
So we get a new body at that point as well. And so he's coming for his saints, and then we will meet him in the air, up above the earth, and at that point, and this is off topic, but at that point, the judgment of believers happens to determine our level of reward in eternity. Jesus reassured his troubled disciples that he would one day return for them, and we've already looked at this, but I want us to see it again. John 14, verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, what will happen? I will come again and receive you to myself. He's coming for us. And where I am, there you may be also. So he's going to come for his, his people, for his saints, for the believers. And then in phase two, later, at the conclusion of the tribulation period, about three and a half years later, this, this coming for his saints happens about midway, and then at the end of the tribulation period, about three and a half years later, Jesus will return with his saints. He's finished judging us in the clouds up above the earth and the atmosphere up there, and he returns with his saints to rule planet earth for 1,000 years, and we get to rule with him. Uh, Jude wrote about that in Jude 1. Um, I always say Jude 1, but there's only one chapter in Jude. It's verse 14. He said, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, seven generations down in the genealogy of Adam, this guy named Enoch lived. It says, he prophesied about these men also, saying, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. So what's the Lord going to do? According to Enoch, he's going to come with ten thousands of his saints. He's already come for them. We've been caught up in the air. We're, we're, being, we're being judged before the judgment seat of Christ to determine our level of reward. And then he comes with his saints. When Jesus returns with his saints, he will conquer the global kingdom of this world, which will be under the control of the Antichrist, who's ruling the world from the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And he will conquer that kingdom, and it will become his global kingdom. John described this event when he wrote this in Revelation eleven fifteen. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. So what's going to happen? Jesus is going to come back here again, conquer the kingdom of the Antichrist, and it becomes his kingdom. And believers get to rule and reign with him. And guess what will happen at that point? then the Jews will finally get those Jews that he has protected during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, and we don't have time to go into all of it, but there's going to be a sweeping evangelistic revival among the Jewish people, and they're finally going to believe that Jesus really is the Messiah, and then God is going to give them what he told them to pray that they would receive when Jesus came the first time, and because of their unbelief, they never got it. What is the Lord's Prayer? That was... That was Jewish disciples asking Jesus how to pray, and Jesus said, okay, when you pray, pray like this. And this is before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. This is in that time period that we call the, the gospel of, of the kingdom. And what did he tell them to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Their what? Thy kingdom come. They, they were supposed to be anticipating their Messiah, their King, Jesus, to come up and come and set up his kingdom. And he told them, pray that his kingdom would come and his will would be done right here on earth, just as it is in heaven. He told them to pray like that. And then because of their unbelief, they forfeited that blessing. And now here we see at the return of Christ with his saints, Jesus will set up that kingdom kingdom and finally the jews will have what they could have had centuries ago had it not been for their unbelief and the saints who return with jesus will rule with him 
in his global kingdom. That's what John wrote in Revelation 20, verse 6. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. And there's more information about that thousand-year kingdom in the book of Revelation, but that's enough to at least whet your appetite for today. So you can kind of see in the timeline of events where the second coming of Christ happens, but we don't know when that's going to be because we don't know when the battle of Gog and Magog is going to be fought. And so we need to look at that and understand that. So here's a conclusion. Here, here's, here's what... what information about the second coming of Christ, about the return of Christ should do for us. It should motivate us to be prepared for it. Isn't that what he said? Be ready. It should motivate us to be prepared for it, to examine ourselves to be sure that we are in the faith that we are authentic believers in Jesus, that we have had a real life-changing, eternal destiny fixing experience with Jesus the son of God and then it should motivate us to share the story with everybody around us that doesn't already know it to be sure that we take as many people to heaven as possible when we go and that they are prepared to meet Jesus when he returns because he will get that you say well pastor people don't want to hear that today i know it i know that but you know what my advice to you is tell them anyway just tell them anyway we did that yesterday we told people the story that really didn't want to hear the story you say well that'll offend them i realize that but guess what i would rather them be offended for a little while now than be offended for all eternity in hell because I didn't tell them. You get that? We just need to tell the story and get as many people prepared as we possibly, possibly can. And here's why. God loves those people, doesn't he? He loves them so much he wants them to hear the story. You say, but that guy's really bad. Jesus loves him. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever was whoever mean even that bad guy even the worst of the worst whoever believes in him that means to believe this Jesus story what the Bible has to say about Jesus and what he's done so we can have eternal life whoever whoever believes in him shall not perish he won't die and go to hell but have eternal life now i realize that in a crowd this side there's always the possibility that somebody might be here today and they've never really understood the story maybe they've never even heard it and they might be saying i've been in church my whole life i know about i know that bible i hear people all the time say i know my bible and they can quote you all kinds of scriptures but then when you tell them the jesus story they say ah i never heard that before what does that tell you about the condition of the church today sad you can go to church for a long time and never hear the Jesus story, never hear how to get eternal life. And so we need to do that. We just need to tell the story over and over again. So I want to tell the story for the benefit of somebody who might be here today and has never heard it. 